This recording is going to cover the adrenal glands. Now the adrenal glands are found just above the kidneys and in some textbooks they'll actually refer to them as supra renal glands because they're superior to the kidneys but I prefer you not to use that term. The, um, these glands are like the kidneys retroperitoneal which means they're behind the parietal peritoneum. The adrenal glands are actually two separate endocrine organs. The outer cortex that you see here will be looking at the various hormones that are producing that are produced by the adrenal cortex but you also have an inner adrenal medulla which you see here. But the adrenal medulla what you'll notice I have this little kind of lightning bolt is secretions of norepinephrine and epinephrine from the adrenal medulla is stimulated by the sympathetic nervous system. That sympathetic innervation is coming from the hypothalamus. So the, the adrenal cortex though is more glandular. The adrenal medulla is actually is a modified sympathetic ganglion which is nervous tissue. So let's do, I'm going to do um, briefly, even though it's covered um, in AMP1, when you looked at the autonomic nervous system, I'm going to review a little bit with you. So we're going to start with the adrenal medulla. It, the adrenal medulla is technically part of the sympathetic nervous system. And it, the secretions from it include norepinephrine and epinephrine. The majority, though, is epinephrine. They will have similar effects on various target organs and I'm just going to review four of them but they have multitude of targets so the liver when you think about when you're in fight or flight mode you're going to need some energy and a great source of energy is glucose so in the liver the norepinephrine and epinephrine bind to alpha-1 adrenergic receptors and the result of that is you increase the breakdown of glycogen or glycogenolysis. So then you have glucose for energy. In the airways, you have bronchial smooth muscle. Okay, so I'll just say you've got bronchial smooth muscle that line the airways, and smooth muscle is a target of the autonomic nervous system. And in the bronchial smooth muscle, you have beta two adrenergic receptors and when the epinephrine and norepinephrine bind to beta 2 adrenergic receptors the result is relaxation of the bronchial smooth muscle okay so bronchial smooth muscle relaxes which leads to referred to as bronchodilation the airways open allowing more airflow. Again it makes logical sense when you're in fight or flight mode you don't want to have issues with getting air into and out of your lungs so it relaxes those those bronchi and bronchioles. Now the heart has beta, I'm going to change the colors so I'm going to get tired of the red, beta 1 adrenergic receptors and beta 1 adrenergic receptors bind to epinephrine and norepinephrine and the response of that is you have an increase in heart rate you have an increase in cardiac contractility and when you have an increase in cardiac contractility it leads to increased stroke volume so the amount of blood being pumped out of the heart increases so with an increase in heart rate an increase in stroke volume collectively that's referred to as increase in cardiac output and so you're able to get more blood pumped out of the heart each minute which again is necessary when you're in fight or flight mode you're going to need to deliver oxygen more oxygen to tissues you're going to need to transport more CO2 from the, the working tissues up to the lungs now the last one we'll look at are blood vessels now majority of our blood vessels are going to have alpha-1 adrenergic receptors and alpha-1 adrenergic receptors the response to stimulation by epinephrine or norepinephrine is it causes contraction 
of the smooth muscle lining blood vessels. And as a result of contraction of that smooth muscle, or I'll just abbreviate of VSM as vascular smooth muscle, what that's going to lead to is vasoconstriction. And so we get to, we'll be able to talk about that when we do the cardiovascular system and the significance of that. We're going to want to divert blood away from areas that we don't necessarily need the blood at that time to areas that we're going to need it. Okay, so those are some of the major effects of epinephrine and norepinephrine. But I want you to see if you remember, just for the heck of it, I'm not going to give you the answer, is think about the eyes and their smooth muscle associated with the eyes. During fight or flight, what smooth muscle associated with the eye is going to respond to the sympathetic nervous system stimulation and what's the effect? So just think about it. Now, so now I do is I want to talk about the adrenal cortex. Now, the adrenal cortex is, again, the outer region of the adrenal glands. You have a capsule, and then you have these three major regions of the adrenal cortex. Now, here's the adrenal medulla here. The three major regions, the zona glomerulosa, the zona fasciculata, and the zona reticularis. So ZG, ZF, and ZR. Each of them produces a major hormone or hormones. So here I want to show you quickly is the zona glomerulosa. The primary hormone that's produced by this region is aldosterone. Aldosterone is classified as a mineralocorticoid. I'll come back to that in a second. The zona fasciculata, the major one is cortisol, and that is a gluco corticoid. The zona reticularis are these two. DHEA, dehydroepiendrostrine dione, or and actually it's, they have that wrong there. Um, sterone, it's androstene dione. And androstene dione, these are androgens or male sex hormones. Now, here, I want to show you mineralocorticoid versus glucocorticoid. Break it down. The coid, I want you to think steroid. So all of these are steroid hormones. They have the central steroid nucleus, which makes them very lipophilic. They're hydrophobic. Notice they all are derived, also derived from cholesterol. Now the corta refers to being produced in the adrenal cortex. Now the mineralo is think the minerals, aldosterone, is involved in mineral metabolism, specifically potassium and sodium. The glucocorticoid is named because of its effects on glucose metabolism. So I just want to show you where they kind of came up with that terminology. Now, because the steroid hormones are lipophilic or hydrophobic, they can easily diffuse across cell membranes. Their receptor is either going to be found within the cytoplasm or within the nucleus. No matter what, at some point in time, the receptor bound to, its, um, bound to the steroid will eventually affect gene transcription. So the effects of these hormones are not very quick to act, like ones that bind to plasma membrane receptors, but they tend to have long-term effects, or little, they last a little bit longer. So they're going to affect, ultimately, the production of certain proteins, or, in which will have certain effects on the cell. Now let's do first, let's look at the mineralocorticoid aldosterone. So that's, again, produced by the zona glomerulosa. Now let's, show, let's look at some of the targets. So one of the targets are the eccrine sweat glands. Remember, eccrine sweat glands are those sweat glands associated with the skin that are involved in temperature regulation. So when you increase sweat, it helps you cool it, each other off. Now what you'll note, what happens though, is the, the, the secretions from the eccrine sweat glands, when they trans, transport it up the ducts eventually to the body surface, is you will have some modification of those secretions where you're going to affect the levels of sodium or potassium in that secretion, which is going to be affect, affected by aldosterone. Other major target are the intestines. 
so that's another one kidneys but we also have salivary glands that are also affected by aldosterone so these are some of your target organs what the effects are overall is it increases sodium and I'm going to say it two different ways sodium absorption or sodium reabsorption so you take in sodium say from what you eat and you absorb it so it's coming across the membrane into your body so it's absorbed when it gets to the kidneys and we filter the blood and we take up the sodium again so it's being reabsorbed so sodium absorption or reabsorption potassium and I'm going to say secretion but it can lead to excretion where it's going to be removed from the body so I just want to you know kind of briefly show you the sodium um, and potassium and what happens so here we're showing you in the kidneys so over here this would be your in your lumen this is your filtrate which if it stays there will eventually be excreted from your body as urine and what aldosterone does is what you'll notice is we're going to increase sodium going this way and eventually back into your bloodstream so it increases sodium reabsorption and you're seeing potassium kind of going the opposite direction it increases potassium secretion which eventually if it goes out of your body it's excreted so aldosterone being a steroid hormone kind of what it does it increases the numbers of these sodium potassium pumps over here it increases the number of sodium channels and potassium channels that you see here on the apical membrane so overall it increases sodium absorption or reabsorption potassium secretion so we come over here what are so, some of the um, how is it regulated and one of the big things that regulate aldosterone secretion is high potassium levels so just think about it what is what are the effects of aldosterone it increases potassium secretion which could lead to excretion from your body so it's a way of kind of getting potassium levels back to normal so this is a major stimulus for aldosterone production but another big one is this thing called angiotensin 2 and angiotensin 2 increases the production of aldosterone but it's going to have some other effects on the body that we'll discuss about when we do cardiovascular system as well as the urinary system so I want to show you what can result in more angiotensin 2 being produced is if you have low blood pressure or low blood volume is the kidneys um, will produce something called renin and renin what it does it's an enzyme that converts angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1 angiotensin 1 is then converted to angiotensin 2 using this enzyme called ACE or angiotensin converting factor angiotensin 2 one of the things it does is it increases aldosterone production so think about why you would want more aldosterone if your blood pressure was low or your blood volume was low is what happens is aldosterone because it does increase the sodium reabsorption if that part of the kidney tubule is permeable to water water is going to be retained as a result of that blood volume can go up but that also will help to increase your blood pressure so those are some of the, the reason why you have more angiotensin 2 but we'll look, learn about the effects of angiotensin 2 in blood vessels its effects on ADH and it has effects on a number of different things so two major stimuli for aldosterone secretion high potassium levels and angiotensin 2 those are major ones let's look at cortisol so cortisol I said was a glucocorticoid this is often people refer to as a stress hormone but it's more of a long-term stress hormone and as a long-term stress hormone its main job is to try to make sure you have adequate levels of glucose to be able to use for energy to deal with stress so let's look at um, some of the effects of cortisol now what I'm going to do even though it's a glucocorticoid I do want to mention that one of its uh, targets are immune cells 
And when we do immune system, we will talk about this a little bit more in depth. Oops, immune cells. It is anti-inflammatory. Kind of keeps inflammation in check. Inflammation is a good thing, but we don't want to have excessive inflammation. And so actually when the inflammatory response is triggered, we do also start to increase cortisol to try to dampen that the inflammation to keep it kind of from getting out of hand. And because it's anti-inflammatory, we kind of use that pharmacologically to treat various kind of rashes and inflammation. So you'll notice there's a lot of synthetic glucocorticoids out there to use for as an anti-inflammatory agent. But it also in pharmacologic doses, not physiologic, pharmacologic doses, it can depress your immune response. So people use it or it's used for things like asthma, um, people who've had transplants to try to prevent rejection, they take pharmaco pharmacologic levels of um, synthetic glucocorticoids. Now other effects of, of glucocorticoids physiologically is its effects on glucose metabolism. So let's look at um, some of its target organs. Target organs include the liver, adipose tissue, fat, and skeletal muscle. Okay, so we got muscle, liver, adipose tissue, and we previously, previously looked at the target organ of the immune cells. Now it, let's look at some of these major things. So I had mentioned that is, think of it as long-term stress, it wants to make sure you have plenty of glucose available in for times of acute stress when you say you're going to be having to run from a from a lion or from a tiger or wherever I don't think we're going to have lions out here in the United States but um, think about running from a bear so fight or flight so adipose tissue never say have a plus GC that means plus glucocorticoids what it does is it affects um, pathways that are involved in glucose metabolism and fat metabolism and actually we're going to look at protein so in the in the adipose tissue it stimulates the breakdown of fat into fatty acids and glycerol so it increases lipolysis now the glycerol is going to be transported to the liver and and with the glucocorticoids it favors the production of glucose from such things such as glycerol so we have that glucose production and that is gluconeogenesis so glucocorticoids actually increase the production of certain enzymes involved in the gluconeogenic pathway. Now glycerol is not the only thing that can be used for glucose. You can use certain amino acids, we call them glucogenic amino acids. Those amino acids will be, or the, the source of those amino acids is from the breakdown of muscle. So it increases muscle breakdown. Or we'll say increase protein degradation. I'm going to say that protein degradation, so think of just not, it will affect not only muscle, other proteins and some of the proteins like say in your skin. So I want you to think about that when you start, when we start discussing the effects of um, um, elevated glucose levels, or not glucose, um, cortisol levels in people with Cushing's disease or Cushing's syndrome. So muscles broken down to amino acids Amino acids are transported, and I'll just put AA, into the liver and again used to make glucose. You have that increased gluconeogenesis in the liver. Well, the liver is going to take that glucose and a lot of it's going to be stored away as glycogen. So you increase glycogenesis. So the idea is if you're in a fight or flight mode, and this is epinephrine here, just my abbreviation, should be just an E. If you're in fight or flight mode, we can break down the glycogen from the liver and have plenty of glucose out there for your body cells to need in that acute stress. So this is where people kind of get, get um, confused is it does increase 
the production of glucose, but it stores it away in the liver for times of acute stress. So it increases glyc or gluconeogenesis and glycogenesis. Cortisol does not stimulate glycogenolysis. It doesn't. It's only when you have the epinephrine in sympathetic mode is where you're going to break it down. Okay, But obviously, glucagon will also affect that. But we're just talking about cortisol as being a long-term stress hormone, making sure you have plenty of glucose for times of acute stress. So you've got increased lipolysis in the liver, glycogenesis and gluconeogenesis in the or sorry, lipolysis and adipose tissue, sorry, increased gluconeogenesis in the liver, increased glycogenesis in the liver, and increased muscle breakdown also increased protein degradation. Okay, so those are the major effects of, of cortisol. Now the regulation of it, this is a, of cortisol is regulated by the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. Because cortisol uh, production is stimulated by ACTH. So ACTH targets those zona fasciculata cells and it stimulates the production of cortisol. ACTH is made here by the anterior pituitary. The anterior pituitary is stimulated by corticotropin releasing hormone, which is produced by the hypothalamus. Now, cortisol is subject to your classic negative feedback inhibition. Cortisol levels get too high, it will come back and inhibit ACTH secretion by the anterior pituitary, as well as CRH released by the hypothalamus. Now you'll notice that corticotropin releasing hormone is stimulated, the secretion is stimulated by a number of different stresses. So pretty much any type of stress, emotional stress, physical stress, can stimulate the release of cortisol. It allows you to deal with stress. So if you do not produce cortisol for some reason, shape, or form, you will not be able to deal with stress. So I want you, you think about it, I want you to look up something called Addison's disease and what results from having Addison's disease. People with Addison's disease will not be able to secrete cortisol, but they're also not going to be able to secrete aldosterone because specifically damages the adrenal cortex. Now the last thing I want to look at with the adrenals are the adrenal androgens. DHEA, androstenedione, that is produced by the zona reticularis. Now, the, those androgens are going to be, um, in males, more significant in development of the male sex organs during fetal development. In the female, it's more responsible for your, where you have your, your hair in the pubic region as well as the axillary region. Androgens are more... Uh, produced by the gonads. So this is relatively minor production of these hormones. But it can produce a, some adverse effects if you have abnormally elevated secretion of these androgens. In males, if you have abnormal production it, when they're young, they can have premature puberty. In the females, the females can, um, that are, can be born with what referred to as ambiguous genitalia. They're, the female will look, appear to be male, looks like they have a penis, but it's relatively small. But the, the CAH is congenital adrenal hyperplasia. There's a number of enzymatic defects, defects, that's a good word, defects that can lead to congenital adrenal hyperplasia. And there are some examples of where they, the girls and or boys have abnormal secretion of androgens. And so a girl uh, could be born looking like um, a male because of the ambiguous genitalia. They would stimulate product or the um, formation of what would look like a penis. So this is the end of the recording about the adrenal glands.